Hello, everybody. My name is Daniel Newman. I'm the co-founder of the Four Minute Screenplay Competition. And today I'm very fortunate to be joined by James Mudge. Uh, James is the founder of the Chinese Visual Festival. Uh, and he is also the founder, I believe, of a film production company. Could you tell us a, a bit about that, James? Sure. Uh, I, mean, I mean, technically, I wasn't 100% uh, the founder of Chinese Visual Festival. Uh, oh, okay. I guess just to, because in case anyone else is listening, I could claim the credit. But <laughs> uh, it was started by a Chinese girl, uh, Jingjing uh, Xie, who started it in the first, and I worked with her on it in the first year, mainly running like the, the PR and the comms and everything. And then I kind of uh, came to take over everything. The first year it was very sort of arts, art based rather than so much film based. It was like a photography exhibition and a couple of documentaries. So, but technically that was still the start of it, everything so i still have to always make sure <laughs> make sure i name check her in there for some credit and everything and yeah. what year was that that uh, uh that we founded so, it? sure so that would be back in 2010 it kind of started and the first edition was 2011 so okay. this would have would have been like the 10th edition this year if uh you know not for the old covid and everything like that as well i'm sure we'll get into <laughs> as we talk about that more so, so obviously, initially you were helping Jingjing to establish this festival, but I wanted to start by asking, how did you become interested in film in the first place, and particularly Chinese film? Uh, sure. I mean, I mean, film in general. I guess I just always, always was from a very, very young age, and everything like that. Yeah, no, no particular reason, but. And Chinese film, um, I mean, I think part of it probably was, you know, some other people would also say the same right about my age, who were kind of exposed to Hong Kong film first. Uh, I guess there was a whole thing like 20 years ago or so where Channel 4, uh, late nights were doing stuff like Mr. Vampire, Chinese ghost stories, Zoo Warriors and stuff. So I kind of got into it in that way and then sort of gradually more expanded into, you know, more, well, I don't want to say more serious Chinese cinema, but you know, more uh, festival friendly stuff. You know, as I, as I grew older, I started to pick up like the Zhang Yimou films and things which were playing at festivals and uh, Feral My Concubine kind of gradually got into it that way. And then from that into more like uh, documentaries and uh, Chinese art and independent cinema as well. So it was kind of a gradual, a gradual journey into it from that kind of Hong Kong based and stuff, which I, I'm still very into as well. And have you spent a lot of time in Asia, in Hong Kong? Uh, do you speak uh, any Chinese dialects? Can you understand any of it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've spent quite a lot of time traveling around Asia. I mean, I've been to mainland quite often, uh, especially for work, usually like once or twice a year for the last five or six years. Uh, I spent time in, quite a lot of time in Japan, Hong Kong, Korea, Thailand, everything. Uh, language ability is limited. Uh, I can understand a lot more Mandarin than I can actually say, which, which can be helpful and not helpful. Uh, and I can curse a lot in Cantonese, so the, <laughs> which can again be helpful or not helpful depending on the situation. Yeah, I'm tempted to ask you to curse in Cantonese. <laughs> I suppose that's not very YouTube friendly. So I don't know. Maybe, yes or no? I'll, I'll, I'll try to hold it back. You know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And so when you're putting together your annual Chinese visual festival, mm. what criteria do you use to, to formulate your program? What are you looking for? Um, I, I mean, I suppose like talking about like the core values, of the, the ideal values of the festival, and everything, you are looking at, uh, I mean, a number one thing is always working with filmmakers who are Chinese, whether they're based in China or based somewhere else around the world. So it's not, say, Western people making a film about China. There's still some flexibility there, but that, that was always the key sort of first starting point for the festival was, I, I don't like saying giving a voice to Chinese filmmakers because it sounds really pretentious and everything, but you know what I mean? It was still working towards a platform for that in the West, you know, especially 10 years ago, uh, where, the, where there was perhaps less on the independent and art house kind of scene. Um, but, you know, moving forward and stuff, obviously, as the festival has grown bigger and, you know, the Chinese industry has changed so much in terms of like independent and art house films uh, over that, even over that 10 years, it's been a huge, huge change. So it's a mixture of like finding the films which are unique films, I guess, which we find ourselves 
uh, from different filmmakers or different avenues. So we're also like other films which maybe have played at some other film festivals, which have either got awards or some exposure, which are not likely to get distributed or bought in the UK, uh, but are still, you know, they deserve to very much to be shown. And then increasingly there's a, there's a very financial angle to, to everything. It's becoming increasingly expensive actually to, to license films, even for one screening and stuff. So, you know, I have to admit that, you know, we might come up with like a short list of films we 100% want to screen. Can we afford all of them is a separate question. Uh, and also because a lot of companies are increasingly, you know, not unfairly looking for like distribution uh, sort of tied into festival screenings and stuff with rights, which is, you know, also yeah. sort of making things more complicated, not, uh, not unsurprising. So it's, it's a real mixture of stuff, but we also have to temper that with the fact that, you know, realistically, a lot of the audience in the UK won't have heard of these filmmakers. They won't have heard of, um, if it's a fiction film, probably won't have heard of the people in them if it's an indie film. So you do have to still lean a bit towards, I guess, topics and things, which might still have some visibility or interest to a Western audience. So it, it's, it is quite like a juggling, juggling act. And we also have strict, you know, we try to do a lot of work on uh, female film directors, queer films as well. So it, it is quite a balancing act sort of trying to pull that all together into what's actually both available uh, and what we can actually afford and also what our partners like the BFI and everything are happy with. So. And is there any reason other than the price tag and distribution requests? Not, not so much, to be honest. I mean, this used to be more of a problem in the past before there was that, um, that law change in China, which kind of required the films to have the you know, release certificates internationally and stuff. So before then, I mean, probably we were getting sent hundreds and hundreds of films, you know, all unlicensed and everything. And at that point, yeah, you had to you know, you had to have some film. We tried to walk like a balance between showing stuff which is challenging and true to life, but which is not necessarily um, going to get people in trouble, whether it's the filmmakers, the audiences, and, and well, myself, I guess, and the rest of the team. We don't really want to get dragged too much into that stuff because I've had a few, few run-ins with stuff in the past. Um, but it, since they changed, since that kind of law came into place, China, Chinese in, like indie films, um, you suddenly start to get way, way less of them. But the ones which were getting produced had more financial backing. Um, and since more of the rise of things like First, First International Film Festival has kind of more legitimized it, um, you're less likely to get more of the, you know, the, how would you describe them? Not, not fringe works, but more, more of the sort of proper non-commercial indie works, which, which were you know, more concerned with the, these kind of like more controversial topics and everything because those films aren't going to get released in China or make money anyway. So there's perhaps less of them coming around now because more, a lot of filmmakers still really want to get their work shown internationally as well. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting onward, ongoing situation how these things kind of develop. You know? And could you give us an idea about how your partners, for example, I saw on your website that the BFI and the Open City Documentary Festival are partners uh, mm. working with you on your film festival. How have they helped you to grow the festival? And maybe you could give us an idea of how big it was when it first started in comparison to now. Sure, I mean, that's 100% that's like a key part of the festival for me. Um, I, mean, I mean, especially in the UK or even smaller than that, say London. You know, even in London, you have something like 60 or 70 film festivals a year. So I always had like a very strong philosophy not to try and rub people up the wrong way or like clash with people or overly compete with people. Because most of the time, you know, the audiences don't care too much about the branding of your festival and it's still the content and everything they're after. So for my side, like the more people we can actually work with, uh, the better if we can cross promote. So I mean, in the case like BFI audience, um, how to put it, the BFI audience is generally older, you know, more aging than the BFI audience and stuff. So, which is fine, but they're very, so they're super keen to try and attract younger people and people from more diverse groups, ethnically, socially, everything, which is great. And then Open City Docs, obviously slightly more towards the academic side, maybe. So there's always that really good sort of uh, virtuous circles where you can work together to actually introduce your audience to their audience, share some of the audience, cross promote stuff together, as long as you're not taking place at the same time. So, I mean, you, you don't always 100% agree on the films and that's where there's more likely to be discussion. Like, 
which of our films you know kind of falls into the middle of that whether it's a film they're saying to us can we partner on or if we're saying to them can we partner on this or like when we work with the bfi um yeah we'll always give them a short list of films which we think are maybe more bfi friendly which is probably going to be the less out there you know hardcore proper crazy indian art house stuff so but there's as long as you're open minded to working with partners it's never you know it's never been anything apart from beneficial for us and i think it's definitely a big part of our our growth um again for certain audience sectors if you know for someone like open city or bfi if they have a chinese visual festival link then it might legitimize them to some audiences and vice versa for us working in china people have heard of the bfi and stuff so it's it's something I try and encourage as much as as much as possible, to be honest. And when you divvy these films up between your festival and mm. say the BFI festival, mm. how does that work? Might they show a Chinese film at their festival that acknowledges and shows your brand at the beginning of the film? How does that? Oh, uh, sure, sure, exactly. It, it can work that way. Um, I mean, it's not so much happened with, I mean, London Film Festival has kind of dropped off on showing Chinese films a lot recently. Uh, the only ones they've ever really picked up are, are, have been ones which have UK distributors already, and they've kind of worked with the distributor. But yeah, certainly with other people we work with, then we would uh, properly co-present the films and everything like that. And, and that's where you get to the other sort of manual manual part of the film festival where do I go along there, have a little desk and sit there with some flyers and a banner and stuff and say, you know, tell to people, or we, we do like some shared intros or Q and A's and everything like that. So, so yeah, you, you do like a, a lot of the film festival work is that kind of, um, you know, that sort of real manual work of the, the co-promotion. And we're always happy to have other people come to our festival if they want to sit at that desk themselves or if they want to intro the film, we're, we're always very happy for that. And I think audiences like seeing that stuff too. You know? okay. So James, how would you advise someone that's just launched their own film festival, how to establish and grow their brand over the course of the first few years? I mean, I think the most important thing is to do as much research um, as you can, because, you know, as, as I've mentioned, the playing field is so crowded already, whether it's Chinese films, other films and certainly in the UK I mean, there's so much stuff like people are not necessarily just going to be loyal to your festival if you do something the same as somebody else there's not much situation where someone's going to jump ship great I'm going to support your new one over somebody else there's enough audience kind of to go around for everyone but you need to research when you're going to happen um, compared to other events but also compared to even things say like Rotterdam Berlin Cannes when some of these other films are going to be screening because filmmakers are going to want their premieres at certain times, you know, they're going to want to, you know, think about attracting sales agents. So, you know, you're going to have to take into account a lot of like scheduling. You're also going to have to take into account how much um, financing funding you need for everything. Um, I think quite a few festivals or events do fall into a bit of a mistake where they just think of the first year and they think, you know, maybe we'll get enough money to continue for year two, year three, but you know, realistically, it's going to take you a long time to build up that kind of uh, audience, uh, that kind of following on social media, everything like that. So doing the research and everything is still, it's still theory, but you really have to do a lot of it. Uh, and I think the more partners you have, the better in that situation. So the more people who can help you cross promote or kind of endorse you, whether it's a venue, whether it's other organizations, everything like that. But, and I think as the years go on, um, it's going to become more and more true. You're just going to have to keep putting more and more work into figuring things out in terms of where you actually fit and why, you know, why people should come to your festival, why they should pay money to watch a film, you know, compared, especially if more and more things are going online and becoming cheaper, then it's going to be an interesting, interesting playing field over the coming years. And there's definitely room for more festivals. Uh, we're, there's someone else I'm going to launch a new Hong Kong film festival this, in 2021. So there's still a room there, but you know, even that it's taken a huge amount of time to actually look through the figures as well. Like really, and a lot of the time you want, you want to think, oh, you know, if I curate something great, everyone's going to turn up, but <laughs> you know, sadly it's not, it's not always the case. So you have to mix that kind of curatorial desire and getting the good stuff, talking to the directors, the films with the, the hard number crunching and the realities of footfall and advertising and everything. So, yeah. I mean, how much of your time is 
dedicated to organizing the Chinese Visual Festival as opposed mm. to uh, your film production work and, and other, other responsibilities. Mm. I mean, it's all, to be honest, like the, the more time goes on, the more I find it all kind of uh, coming together, kind of into one place now. I mean, because I, th I think I mentioned before, like a lot of times when we're talking to Chinese companies about screening their film, now they're more apt to say like, you know, can you also help us distribute it and everything? So with my, with my company, I've done a lot of film sales work in the past. Don't really enjoy it, to be honest with you. There's not a huge amount of money to be made in there. And if you're getting 20% of somebody's box office share, you know, you're the one who ends up doing most of the work and it's not much fun. But at the same time, then if you, as a producer, then if you can prove that you have like distribution connections and if you're working with something, I, I, you know, some of this stuff is more on the niche side that if you can prove that you can actually put something out there or find a distributor to put it out there or, you know, partners to screen it you know, more widely, like uh, online, then it helps. So this stuff is kind of coming, it is coming together a lot more naturally though my film production work is quite different in theme to the chinese visual festival stuff so yeah it, it's an interesting and changing situation for that as well i think and what kind of help and services do you think that film festival owners like yourself need in the mm. present day what, what what's on your wish list uh if, if i could be your, <laughs> your your genie your film festival mm. genie what what kind of things do you need help with? Uh, finding money. That's, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the moment. I mean, I think for everyone, I mean, it's not that stuff like curating is easy, but curating is curating. You know, it's something you can, you know, you can work out. You can, you know, you know what kind of films you want to show. You can find an image for your festival, but actually finding enough money for, and costs are going up for, for film fees, um, especially, you know, in China, you have so many, you have these indie films being produced, but they're not necessarily making money. So the fees are going up to actually screen one of them. So if somebody wants like uh, 2000 pounds to screen a film, and you know in the UK, you're only gonna make 500 pounds maximum from your mm. audience, then you've got to make up that shortfall because it's a great film and you know you want to show it. But you know, you, you need that kind of financial input uh, as well for marketing, your film transport. Uh, social media covering guests, you know, hotels, air flights, everything like that. So it really, money is definitely the key challenge. I mean, there's enough excellent films out there um, and there's definitely an audience for them, but there's still that disconnect. Uh, and I think kind of a widening disconnect from, from other festivals I've talked to as well, uh, because whether you're getting, looking at government money, private money, some other sources of it, the, the amount of funding is just getting lower and lower every year. And you know, finding sponsors for festivals is a minefield as well. Because, like, do you take on that commercial sponsor who wants to show like a five-minute airline trailer before every film, <laughs> or you know what I mean? Like, and then they play for all your flights. So, mm, we we've been in some situations of that before, where we've had complaints from audience members who were turning up to watch like a pure indie indie doc, and then be like, why why are you showing adverts before? Which I totally understand, but you know, it's a tough decision as well. So I think finance is the main thing. I mean, getting films, uh, getting guests, getting team members, everything you can handle if you have enough money. You know, not even a huge amount of money. No one's going to turn this into a massive profit venture, but enough so you can comfortably do stuff. I mean, you don't want to get down to the stage of talking to some indie filmmaker who's like, you know, remortgaged his flat in China to make his film. And you're like, oh, great, I'll give you 50 pounds. Just let us screen it. You know, it's, so you feel bad about that as well. So it, it's, but how you actually get to that stage of balancing the, I guess, the art and culture side. Like, you know, we have something valuable to show people. We will get audiences, but you know, to actually cover all those costs, that, that that's definitely the challenge. And I think most film festivals would probably, probably agree with the same thing. Okay. That. So wishes one, two, and three are all the same. That money, money, money. Money. <laughs> Last question about uh, your film festival. Uh, mm. How has the coronavirus impacted the Chinese Visual Festival? And is that going to affect the way you approach your preparation for 2021? Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, hugely. Uh, I mean, for 2020, we, we just managed to get our Chinese New Year program out the door because that was still at the stage where, you know, a lot of people in the UK were still saying this is a problem in China. It's nothing to do with the UK. And everything so it's literally the end of january so we got that done that was fine 
Um, yeah, then obviously our May festival didn't didn't happen. It was going to be postponed till August, and of course that didn't happen. September didn't happen. Then after that, you know, we just took the view. Look, no, to be honest. Um, I think this year quite a, a few festivals kind of rushed online without really, probably because they had to. I mean, they were committed to going ahead, so they went ahead with online editions, which weren't necessarily. There was still like a physical festival run online, which doesn't really work. It's a completely different kind of marketing. Even just the fact of like not being there in person, or you know, do you do you make films available for a week, or do you have like set screening times a day for online? It just doesn't work quite the same way. So we kind of made a decision um, that we weren't going to rush into some online events this year because uh, I, I think we needed more time. And all and it's also it's just much much more expensive. Because when we work with our, our venue partners, we generally share venue, uh, sorry, share revenue, or we have some other arrangements. Whereas for an online platform, you know, you either need to pay a fair amount of money for a hosting platform, um, and then you know, make your money back off tickets, or, or you find if you're very fortunate to find a partner who's willing to effectively brand the festival as their own and put it on something like BFI Player or someone like Curzon, which is still cool, but. It's a very, very different proposition. So Chinese New Year is going ahead uh, in physical form at the BFI. And the new Hong Kong Amit event we're working on is going to launch in February, which will have physical screenings and one week online as well. Um, and then again in March. But to be honest, we'll have to see how May, June looks for the actual physical festival. So as well now, we have this huge backlog of films from like 2020, not just for us, but for anyone, for like these films which never screened at festivals. And it's a mixture of some which are desperate to get screened at places and some which are thinking that we need to make back the money we couldn't make in 2020, so we're going to charge double for a screening fee in yeah. 2021, which for a 2019 film, it's not really going to fly. But it, it, it's going to be an interesting year. A lot of festival, because pretty much every festival even if they went online, had to really cut back their activities. So next year, are people going to accelerate into stuff? There's already a lot of interesting chat about like Rotterdam's plan, Berlin's plan early in the year. So at least we have a bit more time than that to figure things out. But to be honest, it'll come down to money um, again as well. If, if we find a way to put stuff online, we will definitely go for a hybrid model. Just because, not just the money, we would also then be able to reach people around the UK rather than just London and, you know, not just that kind of smaller cinema, cinema audience. Cause I think there is a growing online audience for this kind of content. So I am quite happy about doing online. I just want to make sure we, if and when we make the jump, we, we kind of do it right. So, so moving on, uh, let's talk in more general terms about uh, the Chinese film industry. What would you mm. say are the fundamental differences between Chinese cinema or if you want mm. East Asian cinema uh, and mm -hmm. Western cinema. How would you explain it to someone that's seen very little in terms of Chinese cinema? Um, I mean, I think Chinese cinema, like mainland uh, Chinese cinema, is certainly different to other East Asian countries and uh, everything. And I think the main thing, I mean, if you look at blockbuster level, not, not much difference, to be honest with you. I mean, you're still getting the you know, the certain level of quality of like action, effects, star power, everything. Does that make them great films? <laughs> you know, the same as does it make some of the Hollywood films great films, everything. So, you, you know, that level is, you know, China spent quite a lot of uh, money and effort sort of, when you say catching up with Hollywood and that, you know, well done, you can make Hollywood blockbusters, which are, you know, popcorn films, which is fair enough. But I think China's main difference is they're still further behind in the, in the, an art house scene, Ma mainly in the distribution terms. I mean, you're getting some really great Chinese art house and indie films these years, but you know, th there's not really still much of a mechanism within China for distributing them. And to me, that makes that more precarious because you're not, those films are not making their money in China much. You, some of them still get released, but you get some like a more weird pattern of the films not getting released in China until maybe like two years later until they've done the festivals in the West, maybe a, semi-successful release in the West. So you can go back to China and say, this was popular in the West, you know, now, now it's coming to China cinema. So that's, that's probably the main difference I would say. It's, it's a lot more top heavy uh, in that kind of blockbuster term and everything, which is never a great thing for sustainability. 
because you know you'll get young filmmakers coming out of film school and they'll make maybe like one good indie film and they'll get sucked into making blockbusters and it's the same as in hollywood so much of this stuff is you know for better or worse it's fun but it's disposable everything so and it doesn't travel very well uh, a lot of the chinese blockbusters as well just because they're if it's based around local humor, if it's based around you know, more local um, themes and subjects. And because the Chinese market is so big, financially, there's not really a massive need for it to travel. If you make your money in China, coming, coming to the UK, <laughs> make congratulations, you might add another 50,000 pounds, which is not even worth the price of the contract <laughs> you know, a lot of the time. So I, I can see why. Um, okay. So we'll see, but I think, in, I think the Chinese industry needs to balance out a bit more you know, in terms of that more i don't know just just more ways for indie films and things to be released around china and everything like that just so you can get like a broadening both for audiences so i think chinese audiences are starting to um you know some of the lower quality big blockbusters maybe you're not doing quite as well as they would have done five three five years ago which is good because you know audiences you know you go to see a popcorn film you still don't want to get slapped in the face by something which is truly truly terrible <laughs> So yeah. I, I think that's changing a bit in China. We are seeing higher quality, and at least on blockbuster terms. But I still think you need more of a broadening out of the market of stuff. And I think you can, we are starting to see some of the, you know, festivals like Rotterdam and Berlin, we're seeing quite a few more Chinese indie films winning stuff. But those films are not necessarily getting then screened around China. Uh, it, it's getting to that stage of um, finding an audience for those films and convincing investors that, you know, kind of having that, both sides of the film industry, like the indie side and the, the mainstream side, both need to be strong, really, to, to make things more healthy. Okay. And it sounds like your five-year plan for the Chinese film industry would be to uh, balance things out a bit more and give a mm. bit of limelight to the independent uh, film scene. Yeah. But mm -hmm. what do you think, in reality, is likely to happen over the course of the next five to ten years? Oof, I mean, that's uh, I mean, because the way the Chinese system changes a lot, in particular um, with regards to even, you know, I mean, one of the things about independent film in China is independent film is quite often, you know, over here, I think of an indie film in the West, I think financially independent. In China, it's still a bit more like if you say indie film, you think something more controversial, maybe, or something slightly more you know difficult i guess but uh yeah there, there have been a few pushes towards like art house alliances and cinema show and more stuff but I, i've never really seen it taking off and stuff so i think in china it's it's just i hope blockbusters will get better and i i don't know honestly i it's a very tough one to be honest i would like to see more indie films making it into the market and stuff but over the last few years i've not really seen it happening too much so i think the best thing to hope for is an improvement in more blockbuster films and some of these you know good quality directors who have made indie films and gone to blockbusters will be given like a little bit more leeway to make higher quality popcorn films because you can still you can still make good films for a mass audience there's, there's no doubt about that and there's no china has great filmmakers great film studios you know it's it's not that the tools aren't there it's just this idea of you know having to make profit from films which is understandable in the film industry so i just hope we'll see higher quality ones and i, and I don't really care if they appeal to international audiences i'm just talking about the china china market here um but that's what i guess i hope we'll see so you're not seeing a church because we're not really getting many filmmakers to replace like the Jiang Yi Mo's or the Feng Shui Gong's, you know, the ones who are the sort of old hands who are making, you know, respected films and they're making blockbusters. Most of the blockbusters are still getting made by younger directors who are still just being hired to do a film. It's not, there's not a mass amount of artistry to a lot of them. They're still, you know, they're still fine by blockbuster standard, but it'd be nice to see, you know, another generation coming through to replace. I mean, Jiang Yimou is still fine. He's still doing his films and that. But, you know, with, well, you know some more of that kind of level of talent coming through. You know? I, was, I, I was saying, apart, apart from Great Wall, which I think was... Uh, um, but, I, it's okay. It wasn't terrible. I thought it was going to be worse. <laughs> I, just, I think it's because it had been... By the time I saw it, because, you know, it made it out to cinemas in the UK and stuff. And 
by the time I saw it, I'd expected something so much worse. Oh, really? I'm not saying, I don't think, it, I'm not saying that it was good, but it, it was more watchable than I thought it was. But I think, to be honest, I mean, that, that's kind of an, a good example in a way, like, because you think, so Zhang Yimou, you know, given his history, directing this film, uh, number one, I think he's doing a film with Hollywood and saw the trailer, I was like, Jesus, this is terrible. But then, if you can, if you just forget it's Zhang Yimou and just compare that film to another Hollywood film or something, uh, like, yeah. you know, The Mummy, the, the, the one with Jet Li, the, the Dragon Emperor, yeah, or whatever it was called. The, the third Mummy movie, yeah. With exactly. A, yeah. And it's, Frazier and all that. It's no worse. I'm not, I'm not saying that doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's no worse than that level of stuff. So if you approach it as like a Zhang Yimou film and you compare it to his good films, you know, not his bad ones, but um, then it's like, Jesus. But if you compare it to a big budget film by the guy who directed the Olympics opening sequence, it's mm -hmm. probably fine. So James, I was hoping that perhaps you could recommend some Chinese feature films that you've seen recently and that you've particularly enjoyed. Sure. Um, I mean, as I've sort of touched on before, it has been a tough year because of the, the lack of festivals and stuff to screen. But there's been, yeah, there's been a few great ones out there. Uh, I mean, going back to the start of the year, um, Xin Yuan Zheng Lu's uh, first film, uh, The Cloud in Her Room, which uh, I saw at uh, Rotterdam, uh, which were one of the prizes. That's a fantastic film. It's a proper hardcore, like indie art house film, which gets into some proper experimental techniques and stuff, which reminded me a lot of uh, Juan Chi, who I think is one of China's, still one of his very best, uh, one of the very best sort of experimental filmmakers in China, who, who did stuff like Po on a business trip and you know, uh, Wind in Beijing and everything. He's fantastic. So that, that's a really great film. Uh, hopefully that'll get you know, screened around a bit more. I think it would if it wasn't for the, the pandemic. Um, then also from the same time period, which I saw at the start of the year, uh, Only You Alone, by the director Jojo, which is um, his second film after one called Mei Li. And, you know, he's, he's male director, but he sort of focuses on marginalized female stories in China. And he has, he's really, really influenced by kind of like Western art, even more so than Western art filmmaking, which makes the films very interesting as well. So, uh, so yeah, Only You Alone is very much uh, checking out though. I think my favorite one, uh, favorite indie Chinese film from the year was uh, Striding Into the Wind, which was by uh, Wei Shu Zhen, uh, which was at London Film Festival not too long ago. And he's, it's his debut film, but he, he had a film at Cannes, a short film before, which won an award. And since then, he's been getting more and more acclaim. He's actually a rapper as well. He calls himself something, I forget his name, but it's like a play on Tupac or something like that. So he's like, well, he is well into it and everything. He's quite hip. But it's a fantastic film, Striding Into the Wind, and it's basically semi-autobiographical, uh, kind of about you know, a guy who's like graduated or failing to graduate from film school as a sound engineer, who just wants to go off to Mongolia. Uh, like, it's kind of sarcastic, because you have a lot of these Chinese filmmakers making, deciding to do like ethnic subjects and stuff, like going and filming ethnic minorities, and oh, it's so exotic, it's lovely. And he kind of takes the piss out of that a bit. And he goes, you know, because he, he's, you know, he's useless. And I, I, it can't be too much based on him in real life because he's a really good filmmaker. It's just him and his pals kicking around, not really doing stuff, trying to get out to Mongolia to film things. And he does get out to Mongolia eventually. And of course, everything doesn't really go great. But that's, that's an amazing film. Uh, and that should, it, it's one of those ones which I guess is, thinking as a sales agent, I would kind of struggle to pitch it to distributors in a way because you can't, really sum up apart from my kind of rambling, <laughs> the rambling way I've just done. And saying it would appeal to guys like me is not, you know, maybe the massive audience, but it's an amazing film. Um, well, I'm intrigued. I, I, I want to know more about this, this rapping director. <laughs> he's great. I mean, he, he's, you know, it, but he's in the film as well. He's got, you can see kind of like, he, he's got like a, a real great mix of like Chinese and uh, Western cinematic influences. So, Although it's like a proper lo-fi mad indie, he's he's very cinema literate and everything. So, and even though it's like two hours long, which should be too long for that kind of thing, it's uh, it's just one of those films like Dazed and Confused where you kind of think, feels like you're hanging around with somebody, and you know they're not the most useful person, <laughs> but it's a great it's a really great watch, and uh, yeah, I I hope it'll play around more places or that somebody brave will actually decide to distribute it pick it up so i think that's a great film too my penultimate question is about uh 
this company Pause TV, um, mm. who have launched this new app, uh, and it's a new business model where people can choose to tip the films that they see. 80% okay. of the tip goes directly to the filmmaker, 20% goes to the uh, to Pause. And I just wondered mm. what you thought of that business model and how innovation like that within the streaming world might change film in the future. Sure, I, I, I think one of the key things in the UK and stuff is that it, it, the streaming model, the online model is in real need of a shakeup in that respect because we've, you know, it, it's been quite slower to develop uh, than in some other countries, particularly compared to something like China, um, as with most online technology. And so at this point, I, I don't think we need more sort of SVOD services and stuff. And I'm already confused by all the VOD services out there, to be honest. So, um, absolutely. I, I think it's a good idea to try this kind of tipping model and everything. Like that. And I think probably the key thing will be how to really engage audiences. So they actually feel part of it enough to leave a tip for stuff, whether it's a, a small tip or a major tip, but if it can work in a way where people feel like they're part of it and they're kind of, you know, they're buying into like a bigger picture. Uh, rather than just you know uh, bite-sized content and stuff, then sure, I, I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting idea, and I'll be very interested to see how it goes. And you know, as I've touched on before, like for a lot of festivals, filmmakers as well, like they're looking for, you know, they're looking for different options for how to actually put content out there which don't necessarily fit in some of these existing models. So I, I think potentially, yeah, it's a good thing for that as well. Great. And my final question, because I know that you produce films yourself as well. Um, so mm. could you tell us a bit more about the Next Day Agency and some of the mm. production, distribution, uh, and communication projects that you're currently working on? Uh, sure. I, I mean, as I've said before, like the, I guess the distribution and film communication stuff is starting to tie in more with the Chinese visual festival stuff. Um, there's a lot of production, production stuff I'm working on is a lot more in the kind of horror, the kind of horror area, for example, which, which is not necessarily mainland China friendly. Um, <laughs> a lot of the stuff I, I'm working on, I'm working with a, a veteran Hong Kong director in particular, where we have a slate of about um, 12 films, which I, I've done half the scripts and he's done half the scripts, which are based a lot more on kind of like, um, things like gong tao like uh, old like chinese black magic and everything and alcohol and you know there's kind of a you can see what i mean it's not necessarily mainland china friendly but we are going for kind of like a fusion of kind of like um eastern and western kind of belief system uh, as well and in a way which should appeal to people but we're having to fix the whole production model around you know both because of not just because of covid but i think a lot of the time um in the West, we're, we're starting to move towards like elimination of these kind of like mid-budget films, like the five million, 10 million pound budgets. There's not much point to those films. So we're trying to shoot these films like a Hong Kong way of like doing like three back to back for the same cost in one, like the same locations over a period of like two months or three months or something. And kind of tying into the old like Hong Kong category three rated films, like Untold Story, Eternal Evil of Asia, you know, that kind of thing and everything. So. And it's, it's going very well so far. I mean, we're, we're getting close to the launch of this new platform, which we're going to tie a podcast into. Um, we're also tying it into like a sort of online ghost hunter series, which again is mixing like Eastern and Western beliefs, but which will probably be, you know, people staggering around in a graveyard, <laughs> everything like that for a while. Not much happening apart from, you know, falling over. But that, I think that'll be quite cool. So that it's, you know, we've been putting a lot of work in. That's been one of the good things about 2020, I guess, is, there's been a lot more time for this kind of production stuff and planning and kind of working out a business model. So we're going to have, everything's going to have to be shot on so much lower risk now. You know, if you think about like a three or four month production, you know, all you need is one, you know, another COVID outbreak and you know, you're pretty much yeah. in trouble. But if you can put these things at like a much lower budget, because you're shooting them back to back and you're sort of focusing on online sales and maybe more than cinema, then it starts to, in theory, make more sense. So we're kind of in the financing stage for that with the hope to roll like the first two or three sort of later into later into 2021, where we can shoot kind of back to back, which will be a mixture of like London and probably Thailand. It was going to be Hong Kong, but I think Hong Kong's a bit tough to shoot in now. So yeah. Probably Thailand and London now. 
so but that's that's going great and, and i'm working i you know produced a couple of short films and everything last year so there's a lot of directors i'm working with with projects but um the, the horror stuff for production is kind of where the focus because i guess that's uh, you know going back to the start of the interview i mean that's how i got into everything was a lot of these crazier hong kong films you know back in the early 90s like your mr vampires you warriors and stuff so i've still got that kind of spirit of films in my heart you know and everything 20 years later or whatever so you know we're trying to recapture a bit of that and you know the guy i'm working with actually he's older and he'd actually worked on some of those films back in the 80s so so james if people want to mm. uh fund your films uh, <laughs> thank you yeah that would be in, nice. um in your in your in a, in a set of three films um mm. how, can they, how can they contact you well you can check out the website which is www.tndfilm.com uh you can find me on the facebook or any of the other social medias or the next day on them um you could wander around east london and Find, find me in one of the, the fantastic bars out here, like the Bow Bells. I'm probably there most of the time. It's my office from office. So, so yeah, check out the website, social media or anything. And very, very happy to hear from anyone who's, you know, you know economically sound. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much for, for talking to us today. It's been really interesting to have someone oh, no worries, man. that not only produces, but is also uh, running their own film festival. And uh, everyone at home, please uh, like, comment, and subscribe. Any questions that you've got for James or for myself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and hopefully we'll see you at the Chinese Visual Festival. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you, man.